hold if they have questions to hold it till the end. Um, they're welcome to raise their hand. Um, it's really up to you guys how this usually works well for you. Usually we just kind of roll through the material and then have a conversation at yeah. the end of the webinar. That's what we can do. And if you have any pressing questions, you can put it in the chat and I'll just ask at the end. Okay. All right. We're recording. Go ahead, Matt. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for inviting me back. Um, I really like this topic. I think there's a lot to be learned. And I want to say now more than ever, but certainly now, I think it is really essential that we're continuing to kind of find that cycle of work-life balance. So I've been in this field for about 37 years, behavioral health, and I've worked in EAP for about 21. And I do know that our emotional security is really kind of predicated and held up on three pillars. And that is trust, security, and predictability. And I think what we're finding now is a lot of people are experiencing, and I mean this quite seriously, this like existential angst. We're not really sure really what's predictable anymore. And we've been shown of anything that 2020 was certainly not predictable. And when predictability is challenged, then our trust and security is challenged as well. And that's why if you're not really sure, well, you might feel distress or anxiety. Um, a lot of it is that existential angst because we might not even be aware that we're focusing on the pandemic and everything that's come along with that. And then we have a vaccine and we're optimistic, but we're really not sure and we can't predict exactly what's going to happen. I know many people are very much um, on pins and needles and rightfully so with the verdict that's going to come down sometimes this week. Our security was definitely challenged and our trust and predictability was definitely challenged. And I don't want to walk down a political uh, bunny hole, but um, the events and malfeasance of January 6th. So certainly now more than ever, we really want to focus on being effective team members. We want to be productive in the workplace and also adding to and really taking a look at the cycle of our work work life balance. And realizing, too, that the EAP remains available 24 hours a day, seven days a week for you, your dependents, parents, parents-in-law, spouse or domestic partner. And again, more than ever, it's important to remember that because when we are stressed, they do believe that people think that they are alone in dealing with it. Intellectually, they know they're not, but emotionally, they feel that they are. So what we want to do is just validate not only our own feelings, um, sometimes of isolation or loneliness, or we're thinking that we're the only ones who experience the constellation of challenges that we do experience, understanding that we're not alone and just having that conversation with a spouse or partner, friends, peers as well, because we're all in the same storm, just in a different boat. And I know I've kind of gone long on this introduction, but I do think it's important that we think about these things as we go through and not just managing work-life balance, but managing the challenges that remain ahead of us. And they are looming and they are large. But one thing I am convinced of, even though we've suffered tremendous tragedies and that the events of 2020 seem to shadow us into 2021, that our capacity for resiliency and adaptation is really just absolutely astonishing. And I'd ask you to think about that as we go through this today. All right, so I mentioned the Employee Assistance Program. Again, it's available. I'd encourage you to become familiar with that. It's certainly a sign of strength when we realize that we are being challenged and that we reach out for that support. We're being proactive and not reactive. We're getting strategies to learn how to ride the wave instead of waiting for that wave to knock us over. The Employee Assistance is confidential by federal law, and it is at no expense to you, your dependents, parents, parents-in-law, spouse, or domestic partner. So really learn more about it, visit our website. I think it's pretty imperative that we um, learn more about the services provided through the Employee Assistance Program. We have a tremendous amount of information on work-life balance, on being resilient, on being mindful, two of my favorite topics, which we're gonna discuss here as well. Um, learning communication techniques to decrease on conflict, how to have challenging conversations with kids or coworkers, Again, there's a tremendous amount of objective, vetted information available on our website, and I would strongly encourage you to become more familiar with that. All right, so let's get rolling. This is the number one thing. If you think about nothing else, this is what I want you to focus on as we learn more about work-life balance, because this is really kind of the whole enchilada. Really understand that work-life balance 
is a cycle and not an achievement. Like we want to achieve work-life balance. What does that look like to us? And really think once you've achieved it, you're like, aha, I have it in my palm of my hand. But then other demands come in. So that balance really isn't there anymore. And we have to make sacrifices on both sides of work and life to achieve that work-life balance. So think of it as a cycle and not an achievement. It's something that we're always putting energy and time into. And again, making sometimes those difficult decisions when we have to sacrifice one for the other. I've actually taken it a step further in kind of my personal mindset. I just think of it as life. I don't think of it as like work or the life because my life is under the same roof as my work. So how do I achieve that life balance? I don't think necessarily we have to see it separately. It's just how do we achieve balance in our life? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So our objectives is kind of thinking about what work-life balance is. You have to have an idea in your head and a definition of what that is. Is it that you want to spend more time, you know, by yourself and less time at the workplace or more time for yourself reading and less time having to do all the chores around the house? really kind of spot unhealthy habits that we do get ourselves into. And the first unhealthy habit is when we think that we're the only one who could manage or make this happen and understanding that we need to delegate and that we don't have to be the one that everybody does come to. Kind of going through and taking a look at our clarifying values, setting goals, prioritizing, and really understand that this is really a time management and an energy management cycle that is exactly the way I want you to think about work-life balance, or again, as I think of it, just as life balance. And I'm going to give something away early on so you can start thinking about this. Understand that every time you say yes to something, okay, your bucket that's full of time and energy is getting drained. And time is a non-renewable resource. So your energy bucket and your time bucket is getting drained every time we say yes to something. I'm not implying that we should go around saying no all the time, but too often, instinctually or reflexively, we say, sure, absolutely, I can do that. And we don't take into account how that taps into other things in our life balance. So just remember, every time you say yes, someone's tapping your time and energy um, budget, so to say, or bucket. So really kind of think about balancing energy management. That really is what it is. And we really have to focus on what is restorative to us, what relaxes us. And it's not being selfish and guilt's the gift that keeps on giving. You really have to understand that we have to put our own mask on first before we try to help others. And human beings as a species do not have unlimited energy. It can be restored, it can be maintained, and we can get re-energized, but it's not unlimited when we say yes to the tasks or um we say yes to everything that someone brings to us. Really think about and focus on what you find rejuvenating. What are you really passionate about? I think during the COVID storm, a lot of people have rediscovered kind of what rejuvenates them. And they understand that, yeah, we took things pretty seriously, but there is more to work than just, there is more to life than just work and vice versa. Understanding that we are going to stumble, there are going to be breaking points. We have to identify what those are. It doesn't matter that we're weak or unable to deal. It's just a process of being overwhelmed and not having enough energy or time. And then we start thinking that, you know, we're not really doing as well as we expect ourselves to. So manage the expectations that we put on ourselves. You're going to hear me say this again. But a lot of the time, I really want the word should to be erased from our uh, vocabulary. Okay, should is a tough word. Matt, you should be doing this. Really, should I? I get immediately defensive when I hear it. So really think about this. Don't should on yourself. Don't should on others and don't let others should on you. Again, it's prioritizing. It's deliberate. It's intentional. It's important. And we have to really identify kind of what restores us, what do we find rejuvenating, what's the um, breaking point. And understand in every single situation under the sun, okay, challenges are on a spectrum from low to high. A diagnosis on a spectrum from low to high. Your political persuasion on a spectrum. Everything's on a spectrum. In my and regardless of whether this is large on the spectrum or small, if we identify what's in front of us, then we can identify what options we have. And in every single situation, as I said, under the sun, 
there are always options. We may not like what they are, but at least we have options so we can make decisions that move us forward. And everybody has a different idea. Just think about the people in your household or your groups of friends. You know, my wife's idea of work-life balance might be completely different than mine. So we're going to have to have these conversations. We're going to have to come to some resolution of how this can be managed and be resilient and move us forward. So what makes the balancing act so tough? I mean, just took a look, take a look at this woman's face. I mean, it is everything and it is disproportionate and disappointing that we're finding women are the primary caregivers for um, their in-laws or their parents, their primary caregivers to their children, and they're the primary ones who are providing the education in a virtual environment. So there isn't too much work-life balance. And as I would mentioned, it's disproportionate and disappointing that a number of women, they're not actually not choosing, but you can say it's a choice of leaving the workplace. And we're seeing that in highly alarming numbers um, as the pandemic continues to stretch on. So unhealthy, unhealthy habits. I know when I was growing up, and again, I'm just a little south of 60, which is a little hard to say out loud. You know, we were raised long hours pay off. Well, that may not be really true anymore. I'm even wondering if nine to five is going to continue in uh, many organizational cultures. And that sacrifice was the way to go. You had to sacrifice your life in an effort to move forward at work. I think we're all under the awareness that that isn't work. That habit does not work. And that's been kind of dismantled, hopefully, over the past number of years. You know, routines and schedules are comforting. It's imperative that we have them. But we can't be so rigid that they're not in, that they're so inflexible that we can't take a look and say, okay, I need to tweak this. That's pretty much out of my control. I can get support for this. And understanding that our routines are important. And as we're thinking about returning to work and personally and professionally, I'm not sure we're going back as quickly as people are thinking. I know a number of people really can't get wait to get back into the work environment. Others, it's going to just upset their complete work life balance. But in any event, we have to kind of future think this at some point, likely, um, you know, the majority of organizations, depending on their culture, are going to return to the workplace. Really manage the expectations, especially those that we put on ourselves. I think there are times we have such high expectations that no one else is even aware about, and yet we're holding us to that high standard. It's okay that if you start out at a four or five and you get yourself to an eight or a nine cognitively, emotionally and kind of doing the work that's necessary, whether that's personal or professional, we start out at a four or five and we get to a seven or an eight, that's progress. That really is. We have to take pride in that. As Jack Nicholson always says, maybe that's as good as it gets for this particular challenge or this particular moment. Really understanding and knowing what your options are. That's where resiliency and mindfulness really do play a huge role. I try to look at things neutrally, not allow a lot of bias and emotion and judgment to come into it. Because we judge a thing as good or bad, positive or negative, we're already tainting what options we have. So really take a look at it neutrally, identify, oh, okay, this is what I have in front of me. Okay, if this is what I have in front of me, what are my options? What choices can I make? What decisions can I make that are going to help me move forward? And as I mentioned, everybody has a different idea of balance. I forgot to mention, and if you could please just real quickly, grab a piece of paper and a pen and just number it from one to 14. Don't worry, this isn't valid. It's not really a test. It's just a brief assessment that we're gonna go through and process together as a group. All right, so you can even write it on your blotter, write it on an envelope, write it on a uh, post-it note. So just think about, again, everything's on the spectrum. One is never, five is always. So as I read through these, just kind of put, you know, a number next to the one, two, three, all the way up to 14. So when overloaded, are you easily able to prioritize and focus in on most critical tasks? Don't overthink this. Just put in what you think. Do you turn work around quick, quickly rather than letting it get backed up? Do you have a good way of tracking your to-dos? Do you have a general structure to your day or week that enables you to feel in control when you do things? Are you physically organized, keeping papers, computer documents, et cetera, at your fingertips? And I'll be completely honest, when I clean my desk area, whether that's in my virtual office at home or when I was in the office, I found it very difficult to find things. 
And again, that's not a rationalization. It just worked for me. And when I cleaned up, I had a great deal of difficulty trying to find something. Okay, number six, do you have productive, efficient working relationships with your coworkers, et cetera? Are you generally pleased with your work-life balance? That's pretty relative. And you're gonna answer that in the way that you're thinking and feeling in this moment. Do you make decisions about what you do with your time based on what you want or based on what others want? That really is that idea that when we say yes to things, and sometimes we say yes because we're the ones to do it, maybe see we say yes because we don't want to disappoint, we want to be liked, we don't want to cause confrontation, it's just easier to say yes. Understanding you're basing this on what others want, not what our needs or priorities may be. Do you spend time just on you? And that's a really important question to ask. Many times people are doing so much for others that they don't realize that their energy levels and the things that they might want to prioritize, the energy levels are getting depleted. There isn't time to do what they want, and it's just very difficult to manage. Is it easy for you to stick to a regular, to a regular personal commitment? Or do others, the way I look at it, do others maybe sometimes interfere, not willfully interfere with what we've already personally committed to? And then coming around the clubhouse turn, do you leave enough space in your schedule to allow for the unexpected? I really try to do that. I don't like being surprised. I find it very, it's not just agitating, it makes me very tense, as I think it does for most people. Are your partner, children, and, commu and you communicating effectively about schedules and commitments? That communication is essential to finding that life balance. Have your partner, children, and you establish clear guidelines about your individual roles and responsibilities in the household. So, um, you know, it's interesting to kind of think about that. I think some of the reason why I had children is because I could delegate to them things I didn't want to do. And do you feel support in all areas of your life? That's a little unfair, but I would want you to consider that. Okay, so kind of add those up real quick and we're going to go through generally what you're thinking about right now. Again, this isn't valid. This was sprung on you and this is just how you are cognitively and emotionally right now in this minute. So 14 to 30 points, you're drowning. Okay, struggling to keep your head above water and barely making it. You aren't getting much done and probably frustrating yourself and possibly some of your friends and coworkers. Now that sounds kind of harsh. But I want you to really focus on if this is where we are, understand we're not literally drowning, but we're not doing enough for ourselves in that regard. And we're just kind of spinning our wheels because we're going in every direction possible and not really have a real plan, a real schedule or a real routine. 31 to 50, you're treading water, mostly holding it together, but it is a struggle. And I'm okay with that. Life is supposed to be difficult. Many items don't get the attention they deserve. You feel under constant pressure and are often filled with self-doubt. And that's a difficult place to be. Now, people who have kind of that perfectionistic tendency, they do have, they're very aware of their accomplishments and what they can do, but self-doubt comes in when they don't constantly hit the ball out of the park or constantly hit that 10 mark. That's why I said, we have to be realistic. Don't shit on yourself and realize that sometimes getting an eight or a nine is really enough. Doing the breaststroke, you have excellent organizing and managing skills and you feel pretty much in alignment, <coughs> excuse me, with your job in your home or just in with your life. So I'm interested in what you guys think if you're gonna come to sharing that at the end and kind of what your plan is to help improve those scores or what your secret and pixie dust is if you're in that 51 to 70 point. All right, work-life balance is a necessity. I want you to hear that again. It is a necessity, okay? We really do have to help and manage those two, identifying priorities, making sure that we're not sacrificing one all the time just to meet the needs of the other. And it is interesting the way the United States um, kind of looks at that we are the only industrialized country without a government mandate on vacation time. I want to encourage you, if you're a leader, to start setting the example of starting taking some time off. We're not in that screaming rush anymore. We're really not. So it's okay to take time off. And for those of us who are considering it, understand that if we are experiencing challenges, no one can read our mind and we don't get what we don't ask for. So I'm really encouraging people to start taking some time. It's essential 
for our overall emotional and physical health. Um, I read a very, very disturbing statistic not long ago, where in 2018, in the United States, 761 million, million days of vacation time were left on the table. I really shudder to think what it's going to look like in 2020 and 2021. So let's really try to take a look at giving ourselves again, as we started out, with that respite, that resiliency, finding things that rejuvenate us and make us feel more refreshed. So clarifying values, you know, are you getting the short shrift out of all this? So make a list of things you really love to do and people you really love to be with. You know, I do put pen to paper frequently to kind of help get the cobwebs out of my head and to look at things a little bit more objectively. Does your list match up with your daily routine? And again, we have to be flexible in that routine, but we have to be able to hit that occasionally. Um, can you fit more of who and what you love into that? And really taking a look, are you on the list? I'm asking you to be compassionate with yourself, manage your own expectations, and put yourself at the top of that compassion list. All right, really think, it seems like an odd question, but really why do we work? It's not a rhetorical question. No one has to work. You know, no one's threatening us about, you know, if you don't work, this is going to happen. We volunteer to do it. And I know that's an odd concept, but if we really think about it. There are millions of people out there who don't work. Or there are millions of people out there who don't need to work. But they may choose to work just because of uh, personal achievement, financial independence, friendship and camaraderie, financial security. So really put pen to paper and say, why do you work? I mean, I work because I do believe what I what I do has value. I enjoy it. I enjoy the majority of people I work with. You know, I enjoy the fact that I have an opportunity to meet a great number of people very different from me uh, because of these opportunities to continue the webinar. So that's one of it. I like the fin financial part of it because that allows me to enjoy things to do when I'm not working. So really kind of take a look at and really put pen to paper and take a look at why you work and are those values being met. So clarifying values, tips for balancing. My number one thing is learn to delegate. I'm not talking about dump. I'm not talking about taking on projects that you know you probably shouldn't be, but you want to please the client. And then you're taking on so many and now all of a sudden you're overwhelmed and you have to dump it on somebody else. That's not fair. Okay, that's again, that's saying yes and having our meter start to run wild on our time and energy. Really learn to delegate and understand that other people can do things as well as we do. They just might do it differently and that's completely okay. So think about that in our work, in our personal lives. It's okay to delegate. We don't have to be the go-to person and the person to, who says yes to absolutely everything. All right, picture what success is and what's the miracle question, okay? What do you what do you think about your life balance? You know, I always kind of look at a miracle question is one, if I wasn't here, who would be doing my work? That's number one. And again, thinking to ourselves, why do we work? And what are we missing out? Are we gonna understand what work-life balance um, comes when we, when we realize that it's a cycle and not an achievement. So what's your vision for your work life? What's your vision for your home and personal life? You know, and establishing those tasks that support your vision. You know, again, we don't get, we don't ask for, people can't read our mind. And unless we're clear in our vision, then there's gonna be conflict, especially trying to um, get that cycle of work life, especially if you have others around you, both personally and professionally. So planning is a priority. Plan a self-renewal activity right after work today. And I'm interested to know what that might be if you're comfortable sharing with that. Plan something time sensitive right after work. You know, again, I don't think everything is a screaming rush, but I know for myself, I enjoy a certain hobby every Thursday and it's very time sensitive. I need to end my day on time so I can go to that event and still be able to par participate. I think it's imperative we do set these wrap-up alarm clocks. Many people can do this on their own. Others are thinking, well, it's almost the end of the day. I can probably crank out, you know, three more emails and two phone calls. No, don't, because it's going to be four emails and four phone calls. 
So when it's time to wrap up, it's time to slow the day down and start to prepare for tomorrow, not take on more work. That's going to take you past that time that might interfere with that life part. Be prepared for resistance. Again, you know, both my adult children are here. Uh, my wife is here and we all might have a different idea of what work-life balance is. So, and really kind of find a role model that can be very beneficial. And again, don't be afraid to have those conversations with others and say, hey, you know, do you feel this way too? Or do you struggle with that? Guaranteed, you're going to get valid. They're going to say, yeah, absolutely I do. But here's what I do. Here's how I manage it. Here's the skill I put into place that helps me learn to ride the wave instead of waiting to get knocked over by it. So again, planning is the priority. Anticipate practical psychological barriers. And these are the ones that we bring on ourselves. Oh, you know, really should do this. I really shouldn't dedicate, delegate this. Or I don't know what I was thinking. I don't, I don't know why I took this on. I'm really in, in over my head, but now I'm having difficulty asking for resources and support. You know, what are your setbacks? What are your obstacles? And taking a look personally and professionally. And I, I'm gonna say this again, even in a leadership role, we can't read people's minds and you don't get what you don't ask for. So understand we may be our biggest um, obstacle. And then we identify it, how are we gonna overcome it? It might be that you'll enlist the support of someone who's objective, like maybe an EAP person or find out more information of how you can manage these challenges on our website. Or again, I mean, if you're faith-based, it's a great place to go to get support. Realize you're not alone in dealing that with this and that it's probably not as bad as we're making it out to be. And most importantly, that you are not alone in dealing with these kind of issues. Plan and denormalize. I don't know what normal is. I really don't. I always consider things that are natural. So take a step back and really ask, what am I thinking about? How is this impacting my uh, emotional base? How does that impact the way I behave? That's the whole purpose behind mindfulness. And I do encourage you to learn more about mindfulness and resiliency. What's causing the unbalance? You know, is it dissatisfaction? Is it feel that we feel we're entitled to something else that we may not be? So that personal self-reflection is really important. And again, bouncing it off somebody who you trust, who you know isn't going to judge or react biased or react emotionally, someone who can react, who can offer you a different mindset and maybe point out different options and choices. Really take a look at what are my priorities and based on that, what's the sacrifice necessary to achieve that, both personally and professionally. We don't want the balance to be so out of whack all the time. Again, this is a cycle. We want to be able to get it pretty much even, knowing it's never going to stay there. And that other times it's going to go like this, but we don't want these to be so out of balance most of the time. And understanding that there is a trade-off in all decisions that we make. All right, so pay attention to your emo emotions. It is very important. You know, do you feel energized? Do you feel fulfilled? Do you feel satisfied? Or do you feel angry, resentful, and sad? And it's okay to experience all the cavalcade of emotions that we um, have experienced throughout the past year. And again, it's shadowing us into the new one. Let me just let you know, there is no one perfect way to cope. You know, and we don't have to do this by ourselves. And really take a look at it. It's important to identify even those challenging emotions and those challenging events that cause challenging emotions. It's important that we identify those and work on res resolving them as well. So kind of reprioritizing, when we do that, we're gonna increase our cognitive and emotional awareness. That's why I'm strongly encouraging, again, people to learn more about real resiliency and mindfulness. And really take a look at yourself. What am I willing to sacrifice to get to my son's ball game? What am I willing to sacrifice to maybe put in for that promotion? These are all questions. You have to look at it objectively and don't allow, as I would mentioned, that existential angst of not knowing what's going to come, you know, just break inertia and get started. You know, so we are willing to make that sacrifice, really identify how long is this going to be necessary? You know, and is it even necessary that I do this? You know, I know many people in partnerships where one will go and take a job in another state, understanding that it's a huge sacrifice, but the payoff might be making more money, having a promotion, maybe getting ready to stretch their skill legs a little bit. 
And that's a sacrifice. People would think to themselves, you know what, the juice is worth the squeeze. It's going to be a struggle, but there's value to this. We're going to get out more than we're putting in. So people always laugh when I say, is the juice worth the squeeze? I use that in my decision making probably, oh, not probably, definitely every day, probably 10 times a day. I think to myself, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is the payoff enough for the energy that I'm putting in? You know, and understand priorities can take, can shift day to day, hour by hour. So now time is a factor. And remember, time, think of it as a budget. So we all have budgets for money. We want to see what's coming in, what's going out, what can we spend, what bills do we have to pay? I'm not saying we follow it, but we have one. And when you think about it, money is a renewable resource. Time is not. Once it's gone, it's gone. So think about your time budget. And every time we say yes to something, your energy and time budget is getting tapped. So really kind of consider alternatives, reflect on the aspects of our life. And again, for me, I consider work and life to be life. You know, really kind of take a look at how much time would you like to spend with family, friends, hobby, or other events. And once you put a real label on that, real priority, then we can start making choices that help us achieve that. And again, I just said achieve, but it is. We're going to achieve the mindset so we consider life as a cycle and not just only an achievement. So implement changes. It comes down to priorities. Identifying the options. As I had mentioned, sometimes it might take somebody in a similar boat or a dissimilar boat to help point out what those options are. We need a change in mindset and perspective so we can see what's in front of us and making those choices that are moving us forward. Really kind of remember, please remember that this is not an achievement, okay? It is a cycle. And when you think about it that way, it really does make sense. All right, so we're rounding the clubhouse turn. We're going to open this up for a little Q&A here in a second. I use this pretty frequently. I think adults are visual learners. So if you take a look at prioritizing, just think about what's due now, and it's important. Now, a crisis, a pro uh, pressing deadline, deadline-driven projects. Those folks who have more of a perfectionist way of looking at things, everything's important and everything's due now. So there's the, that constant rush, that con constant pressure to perform. So just kind of taking a look at number two, do later, but it's important. Okay, that's great. That gives us time. You know, that gives us an opportunity for planning and empowerment. If it's due now and not important, those are those interruptions. And I try to plan my day where I can do more busy work or take a look at my day where I can plan for the most interruptions. You know, and many times I'll put my um, out of office on just to let people know, you know, during this time, I am really not available. You're going to need to wait, figure it out, or go to somebody else. And that's completely okay. Do later, not important. That's a kind of trivia or busy work. You know, and think about this and add it to your life part of it as well. This isn't only just prioritizing for our work. And then really kind of think about it, you know. Are you spending enough time on the prior on your priorities? Is a lot of your time going to quadrants one and three? Do now important, do now not important. Move this stuff around in your boxes. Not everything is a screaming rush like, like number one, okay? we have to prioritize how we're spending that time and that energy. So I already used the analogy that time is like a bank account. Really kind of take a look at it. If you want to have an understanding of where your time goes daily, and I've done this three times during the COVID storm. Take out a piece of paper every day. And in half hour intervals, I kind of just check out what I'm doing. Am I having lunch? Well, you're going to discover the patterns start to develop. Wow, I haven't had lunch in three days, so I gotta change that. I had to make that a priority. And just kind of mark down what you're doing personally and professionally. Even in terms of sleep, it's important to track sleep. Sleep is one of the most important biological functions that we have that helps us rejuvenate both cognitively and emotionally. So really kind of take a look and practice it for a week. And you'll really kind of see where your time is going. You'll see also where you're most invigorated, where you can take on those challenges Usually that's in the morning for most people and save some of that busy work or that work that may not be so important for later in the afternoon when you're experiencing 
maybe that car boat crash or just feeling a little more less enthusiastic or not motivated. So take time to organize your time. Um, I recommend to people put breaks in your Fitbit, put it in Outlook, put it in your phone and making sure that we are taking those breaks. Creating a weekly to-do list. I basically do a, uh, um, a daily one. I find sometimes with weekly, weekly, I'll have my whole index card. And yes, I'm old school. I still use index cards. That is just too full. And I get overwhelmed just looking at everything I put on it. And then I experience analysis paralysis and I can't get started on anything. So I try to keep them in my priorities. I try to keep it to something that's going to rejuvenate and make me feel good. And again, strike stuff off your list as you go along. It's great. It feels good. And your brain is going to be awash in those feel-good chemicals like serotonin and dopamine, those reward chemicals. And really taking a look at, okay, what is the priority? Who else can do this? Is this something I have to act on now? And we're the ones driving the train. So with that, I am going to take myself off the chat feature. Again, webinars, I mean, take myself off the share feature. Webinars go much quicker than if we were in person. So let me figure out how to do this again. Wait just a second. And I'm going to take myself off the share feature and open it up to you folks. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording as well. And while we're doing that, there are a lot of apps that I'm interested in. 